Uh, we are in a series. We are in a series called You Asked For It. And uh, so get your Bibles. I'm trying to think of where I would have you turn. Deuteronomy. I'm going to have you turn to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, uh, and what, what we did is, is, is we asked you and said, hey, will you ask some questions? And we, I put together a, a series of messages really based on questions that you asked and trying to answer a lot. And we've had some great, great topics, really great questions. Uh, even last night I was at dinner with some friends and we were just having dinner and they said, they said, wow, these are really interesting questions. And I said, I know I wouldn't have picked these questions either. This is what it's, I'm like, I want to do this series every year because I don't know that I would have picked these questions, but they are fantastic questions. Um, probably getting the most feedback in a positive way from people in our church saying, thank you for that message. I'm like, no, thank you for asking the question, you know? So, um, but what I'm going to do today, so we've talked about eternity and we've talked about hell. And last week we talked about having doubts and, and something that's become very prevalent in our culture, uh, where people are deconstructing their faith. And that's kind of the, the buzzword deconstructing or deconstruction. We talked about that last week, got a lot of great feedback especially from our younger saints, um, got a lot of great feedback, and it was really fun. In the 11 a.m., uh, a lot of students will sit up here, and it was fun watching them during that message because they were just like leaned in and listening, and when you see a bunch of teenagers leaned in and listening, that's a good thing, right? And, uh, and so that was a great message if you missed that one. Today, I'm going to take a few questions. Uh, so uh, I called the message, How I See It. Um, and, and I'm going to take three or four questions, however many we have time for, I have, and I'm going to try to answer them because they were questions you asked that I thought were good questions. Uh, so we're going to pray and we're just going to dive in. Are you ready? So this is almost like a buffet because th these questions are not connected. So my points are not connected. I'm just answering questions. We don't really have points. That doesn't mean there is no point to the talk today, right? That doesn't mean there's no point. Um, you know, I, we ask, I think it was in a hermeneutics, uh, class, we asked, the professor, how many points does a good sermon have? And he said, at least one. If you can get one good point in there, you'll, you'll do okay. So um, let's pray together. God, as we open your word and we try to answer questions that really your word answers, God, let us have open hearts and open minds and let us not miss you in this moment um, because God, you're going to speak to everyone in this room if we'll listen. God, you're going to speak to all of us today. Um, and so, God, we just set our expectation to receive from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this one's not up there. This is a bonus question, but I thought about this morning. I wanted to ask it. I got a question. I'm, 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 new, I'm a new believer or I'm saved. Now what? So let me really quickly tell you what I would do. Number one is commit to being a disciple, which is a problem I see in church culture as a whole. We, we're committed to being church attenders sometimes, but we're not committed to being a disciple. So if you commit to being a disciple, let me tell you, instead of telling me, I, I could say, well, go to first step, get in a life group, take next steps, join a serve team. Those are things disciples do. But if I said commit to being a disciple, what that means is now take your faith very seriously and those things just naturally happen. So you're naturally going to get up and pray. You're naturally going to read the word of God. And here's what I would say. You say, well, I don't know how to read the word of God. Just start in the gospels, look for the red letters and listen to the words of Jesus. And it, well, I don't understand. Just keep reading till you understand something, right? It, ask the Holy Spirit for help, but establish a routine that say, I'm going to be a disciple, so I'm going to commit my life to Jesus. What does that mean? I'm going to give him time every day. I'm going to be at his house every week, and I'm going to be connected and get involved. I'm going to take next steps. That's, it, really, that's all you can do. It, get, I would say get in a life group because you need to be around believers. Your life is moving in the direction of your cl five closest relationships. Listen to what I just said. Your life is moving in the direction of your relationship. So get around some, some people who are committed to Jesus, um, and that'll help. So bonus question. All right, now, you ready for the rest of the questions? This one's a good question right here. Um, here we're going to put it up here. It says, how do you, here we go, how do we talk to our kids about the current events in our culture? That is a great question because the current events of our culture are crazy. 
Like, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been here a while, but it's crazier than ever. And so when I thought about this question, I was asked this question several different ways, several different ways. And by the way, if you're like, my kids are grown, well, you have grandkids. And I, I just want to say, do never underestimate the, the power of being a grandparent and the influence of being a grandparent. Uh, my 20-year-old son's away at college. He probably talks to my parents more than me. Because, like, I will be talking, like, I don't, I, you know, I mean, we, we text all the time and, and usually talk about once a week on the phone, that kind of thing. But I'll be talking to my parents and be like, yeah, you know, talk to Luke the other day. I'm like, I, he just wants to talk to them. So if you're a grandparent or a parent, then this, this question. Um, when I thought about this question and the different variations of what I would call a similar question, I think here's, let me give you, because the question is, how do we talk? In other words, we need a platform or basis from which to talk from. Does that make sense? We don't want to talk around and we don't want to talk incongruently or nonsensically. I don't know if that's a word, but we, we want to make sense when we talk. So my thought is, okay, because obviously I'm a dad, I have three kids. Um, they're all teenagers. One's away at college. One's a senior in high school. One's a junior in high school. So it's fun times. We pay a lot in auto insurance nowadays. Um, yes, about $8 million a month in auto insurance. And so, um, <laughs> um, but the, the question is, how do we talk to them? And so I'm going to answer this by saying, and I'm going to give you something to work from. And I think this is how, in other words, the place you speak from, talk from, teach from is a biblical worldview. Okay. It's not something we really break down. Every, by the way, everyone has a worldview. Some people don't know what it's based on, but they have a way they see the world, right? That's why I call the message how I see it. In other words, a worldview is this overarching set of beliefs values and behaviors. So, so what I believe about me and the world about God determines what I value and what I value determines what I choose to do or not do. Does that make sense? So this belief is a big thing to believe or not to believe, right? That is the question, right? And, and so when we're talking about a worldview, it speaks to origin it speaks to meaning, it speaks to morality, and it speaks to destiny. So a, a worldview tells me how I got here, why I'm here, what's good and bad, and where am I going? These are the big questions of life, right? We talk about these questions all the time from the Word of God because it answers these questions. So when we're talking about a biblical worldview, what we're talking about is we want the Bible to inform how we see the world. We want the Bible to inform how we view our lives. We want the Bible to determine our belief system and our values and our ultimate behaviors. That, that's what we want. And when we want to raise kids, here, here's what I know is that generate, you think about like in the book of Judges where it said there grew up a generation that didn't know the works of God essentially. Because every generation is, is like a degree of separation from God if we don't work on it. Like I've seen this in my lifetime, right? Because it was like, you know, every generation you go, if, if you don't teach them and instruct them, then they just get a little bit farther and a little bit farther. And so when we look at where we're at today as a culture, if you think about it, not that I'm going to blame everything on this, Compare this, and some of you could do this, to the day we had prayer in school. When we were talking about God in school and praying in school, um, now look where we're at, you know, some, what, 50 years later or something like that. Look at where we're at today, right? And, and you say, well, how did we get here? Well, it's just, you know, every generation has a degree of separation. That's what it is, right? Right. So when we're talking about how do I talk to my kids, well, I want, a, I want a platform to speak from, and that's the Word of God. So let me give you a couple of scriptures, because the Bible tells us that the way we live and the way we think should be different than our culture. Okay? This, I, I, and, and again, I have to hurry because we have a lot of questions. But the way we think and the way we live should look different than culture. All right? 
And you can apply that in a lot of ways. I'm going to let you use your imagination. But people should be able to see a difference in the way we conduct ourselves and the way we live and the way people who do not profess, or, you know, here's a new term, people who are not practicing Christians, right? You know, we used, they used to, that used to be more in Catholicism. There's practicing Catholics and, and non-practicing Catholics. You see that more in Catholicism. Now you see it in Christianity. Well, I'm not a practicing Christian. Then let me help you with the term. You're a lost person. Let me help you with terminology. I'm not a, there, there, you can't listen. I would love the apostle Paul to speak to us today about non-practicing Christians. Cause I don't think he would be as nice as me. You're talking about a man that told the Corinthians, whether I come in love or with a whip is totally up to you. (laughs) He was about to go straight up apostle gangster on him. You understand? Psycho Billy Ninja on the church of Corinth. And so let me give you a few verses. These are the obvious verses. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. So we're not supposed to think the same or, or be, behave the same. Second Corinthians said, all scripture, how much scripture? All. Not just the parts I understand, not just the parts I like, and not just the parts I agree with, all. All means all, and all, all can ever mean is all, all means all. But I don't like that verse. Don't care. <laughs> Neither does God. He wasn't trying to, I mean, it, the Bible's been a bestseller since, you know, we've had it, right? Since canonized in the fourth century. Um, but, but, uh, God didn't write it to make us happy. He wrote it to make us holy. That's why it's called the Holy Bible, not the happy Bible. (laughs) That was awesome. I never heard that before. I like that anyways, but here's a verse that I love you know, all scriptures breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for proof, correction, and training in righteousness. In other words, everything we need in life, the Bible is where we go back to. Colossians 2, 8, I love this verse because when you're talking about a biblical worldview, I think this is it. It says, do not let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of that. going. I think Paul knew what was going on. He knew what was up when he wrote that verse. Are you with me? So I want to just show you a biblical worldview. So guys, if you'll go ahead and put this up here. Um, yes. So when we're talking about a biblical worldview, let me just explain what we're talking about. Because if you think about this, this tells you how to talk to your kids. If you're asking a question, how do I talk to my kids? Think about this. Well, what do we teach our kids? That we came from God, we're sustained by God, we live for God, we exist for God, and we return to God. So God's the focus. Does that make sense? What's the standard? The Bible, whether we like it or just like what we just talked about, whether we like it or not, the Bible is the standard. By the way, when we go to find out what the Bible says, we start with, I want to find out what the Bible says. We do not start with, I want the Bible to say this. Because this is prevalent in our culture. It's called eisegesis or eisegetical study. And essentially, we, we, we take and impose different terminologies and ideas. And, and all of a sudden, I'm enlightened by all. And I've talked to you about, don't get your theology from TikTok. Because someone will be on there and they'll be explaining something. And I'm like, that is not, I mean, I will go to my Bible software. And I'm like, that is not the Greek and the Hebrew. And they don't know what they're talking about, but they are making the Bible say what they want it to say. And that is not how you read the Bible. The way you read the Bible is it has to be congruent from Genesis to Revelation. You can't pick and choose different verses to say, well, I like this and well, I like that. No, 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 no. no. You have to find the meaning of the God who wrote it. What is God trying to tell me? Not what do I want God to agree with? The standard. The goal is to be holy, set apart, look different, set apart from the world, set apart unto God. We should look different than culture. Our home, we're living for eternity. We're not living for earth. Does this make sense? Because it tells you how to talk to your kids. The problem, I put death because sin opened the door and death was the ultimate problem, but you could say separation from God or sin is here, right? And we're all guilty of it. 
our attitude then is, oh, this should be humility. So our, I, may, I probably wrote humanity. I'm sorry, guys, but this is supposed to be humility. So our attitude is humility. <laughs> yeah, it's probably me. I sent them what to put. So it's probably my fault. You know, I don't, I'm not the best typer. Anyways, and I don't proofread anything. That's my problem. Anyways, um, it just takes, I don't have patience. I was tested the other day for patience. It came back negative. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> So the, our attitude then is humility. Why? Because we've all sinned and we're separated from God and that's a problem we can't fix on our own. So we're, we're humble and then we live by faith. We live by faith. Now, let me show you what you could call it a secular worldview or a humanistic worldview. So guys, put that up here. We'll compare them. So a humanistic worldview, my focus is me. I live for me. I love me. I am happy about me. I want my life to be good. Me, myself, and I need to have a good time, right? So our focus, we're just living for us, all right? What's the standard? Culture. As culture goes, so go I. When culture tells me what's good, when culture tells me what's bad, when culture tells me what I should be after, what I should be pursuing, what I should be thinking, Culture is my standard. I'm keeping up with the Joneses, as we used to say. I want to be like everybody else. I want, to, I want to have what everybody else has, culture, all right? And what's the goal? Well, the goal is to be happy. That's the goal here. He who dies with the most stuff wins. I want to be happy. I want to go on enough trips and vacations. I'll charge my way into Oblivia to get another vacation and post it on Instagram so people understand how happy I am. I want to be happy. And it's not just I want to be happy. I want to convince you I'm happy. <laughs> Where is our home? We're just the world. This is it, man. This is what we're living for. We want a good life here. We want to live for now, right? And what's the problem? Well, the systems are the problem. I'm not the problem. I didn't do anything wrong. I was just born here. So every problem we have is because of a system that someone else created, and because it's that, then it's, I'm not responsible to fix it. Not my problem. I didn't do it. So what I can do is just get on, get on whatever medium I want and criticize every system that exists because the system's the problem. And so I'm arrogant because I'm right and all these other idiots couldn't figure it out. <laughs> because they're the one who came up with the systems. That's the problem. All the stupid people that put together the stupid systems. And now I've got a blog about the stupid systems about how smart I am. I know this never happens in our culture. And how do I live? Oh, I just live by my feelings. What feels good, what I feel like, what I don't feel like. That's a humanistic worldview. Now, some of you are like, now let me, let me just... Did that sound familiar when I talked about that? If you like our own social media or you have watched TV or the news or whatever, does that sound familiar? And so as believers, we're like, oh man, bless it. You can't live this way. But let me tell you what I'm seeing more and more that's scary to me is, hit, hit that next slide, guys. We're trying to mix these. Because here's what's happening. Well, I believe God is the focus, but doesn't God really think I'm the focus? Do I exist for God or does God kind of exist for me? Like he's supposed to help me, protect me, bless me, provide for me, watch over me, give me what I want, take care of me. Like in a way, God kind of exists. And, and, and here's, here's the, the reality. Like I know the Bible is the standard, but you know what? Now there's a different way to view it. Like we've had the Bible since, I mean, we've had the New Testament canonized. We've had the Bible for a long time. So it depends on whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, but we'll just go with the New Testament. So the New Testament was completely canonized. In other words, we accepted it as the New Testament with the exception of Catholics because they had another part in there. It's kind of a long story, but since about 398 AD. So, so, you know, what is that? About 1500 years or so we've had the Bible. So about 1500 years we've had the Bible, but in the last five years, we finally figured out it actually tells us different things. It actually tells us that, that culture's okay and that I can live this way. And I, and this didn't actually, my favorite is I, this doesn't actually mean that. Yeah, it does. 
Listen, this Bible has been picked apart. Like, if you understand what it went through to be canonized and all the people that have, and not only that, you, all the people that have attacked it, trying to disprove it, and it still stands today. No, you don't have some new fresh revelation, Bubba. That's not what you have. So, so, and then this is my favorite. Like, I know God wants us to be holy, but I think God wants me to be happy too, right? Doesn't God want me to be happy, pastor? Actually, no. I would love to have the Apostle Paul talk to us about how God wants us to be happy when he's like, I've been shipwrecked, I've been whipped, I've been stoned, I've been snake bit, all for the gospel. Well, Paul, I thought God wanted you to be happy. He's like, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that verse? Rejoice in your sufferings. You know, James thought, anyways, all right, I'm going to go on. And then our, I know ultimately you're going to wind up in heaven, but let's have the best life we can now and we'll worry about heaven when we die. Like the problem is sin, but also the problem is kind of systems. And, you know, and you go down through here like, yeah, I'm supposed to live by faith, but don't feelings matter? I mean, I, I feel this way. I, I, I like this thing. I'm attracted to that and this, you know. And this is the problem, guys, is what I see more and more, especially with the younger generations, is they're, they're confused. And they've, they've, here's the thing. Here's what you need to understand as a parent or grandparent. This is what they're bombarded with about 18 hours a day. And, and this, they might get an hour a week. So we wonder why it's confusing. Right? We wonder why it's confusing. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we handle this as parents, as grandparents? Well, let me tell you what Deuteronomy 6, this is why I wanted you to turn there. Hear, O Israel, because the Lord, God actually tells us about this. And he tells us about it in Deuteronomy. So he knew in Deuteronomy we were going to need to talk to our kids about things. Watch this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. In other words, tattoo it on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so I was, let, let me just show you from this text what God says. So I, I'm going to give you four things if you're a parent or a grandparent really quickly. Number one, what this text says is commitment. And here's what he says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. Here's what I'm going to say. Before you can talk to your kids about loving Jesus, you better make sure you do. Yeah. Let me give you a quote. Your children, grandchildren, will not be more in love with Jesus than you are. With every generation, there's a degree of separation. They will not know more about the Bible than you do. I know it's kind of quiet. And so what your children need to see from you and your grandchildren need to see from you, they need to see a commitment to God all the time that is unwavering and consistent. Um, I get up in the mornings before my kids get up, and that's when I have my quiet time. Now, I'm a little bit strategic with this in that, A, I get up before they get up because it's actually quiet. Before the, I need the, where is the, can you help me with the, I need some more money, whatever, you know. Um, and I have a chair that I sit in in, in the living room, and uh, the way my quiet time typically ends is when the kids come down. But think about it because my kids come down every morning to a dad sitting in a chair with his Bible open and he's praying or reading his Bible. I don't ever tell them, oh, I'm reading my Bible. They just see it. Because I need them to know that dad just doesn't stand on a platform and talk about the Bible. I need them to know that dad prays for them in the morning and dad reads his Bible and he has his own time with God. I need them to know that. I don't need to tell them, I need them to see it. Your kids need to see your love and devotion and commitment to God. And I'm going to say things. We have to watch out in our culture because I know sports are a bigger thing than they've ever been, and I'm not against sports. I played them. My kids played them. But you need to make sure that your kids see that you're more devoted to God than their sports. 
however you do that. I understand some games are on weekends and this, that, and the other. I'm not going to tell you not to do it. I'm certainly not going to make anybody feel bad. I'm saying you're going to have to work harder because when I grew up, we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, right? And then we had prayer meeting at some point. And sometimes we had, you know, Saturday morning soul winning or visitation. We were at the church house all the time. In our present culture, the average family attends church about once every four and a half weeks. So if you have children and you go to church once every four and a half weeks, you understand you're going to church about 15 times a year. But yet you go to 15 baseball games in a season, you know, in a few months. I'm just saying this is just to make you think I may need, I may need to think strategically so that they see how devoted I am to God, right? They need to see how devoted I am to God. Um, you know, for our kids growing up, we, we never had discussions about could they go to church or would they? Uh, we raised them in church, so they just think it's normal to go to church. And so now they're in student ministry, and they love uh, Pastor J.W., and they love going to student ministry. I never tell them they have to go. I never make them go. I've never made any of my kids go to church. But they, we, they, they were raised seeing this is a value. We go to church, like not, not because we're the pastor, but we go to church because we love Jesus. And I just want to say, parents, if your teenagers are not in student ministries, you're missing an awesome opportunity because we have an incredible student pastor and incredible student ministries. And, um, and I understand you're like, well, I can't force them to go. I, I understand there could be a little bit of that now. Well, I never made them go or whatever, and now they just don't want to go. But you can encourage them. Now, I'm going to tell you what my dad would say. Why can't you force them to go? <laughs> like, who's paying for the bed they're sleeping in? And the, you know, I mean, my, I'll just tell you what Papa Ron would say. Like, oh, yeah, you can force them to go, all right. You sure can. But I'm going to be nicer and just say, maybe there's some conversation you need to have. But anyways, commitment. Here's number two, diligence. Here's what it said. Teach them diligently. In other words, what's your plan to teach your children about a biblical worldview? What plan do you have? And there's a lot of different plans you have, but you need to have a plan. I'm going to give you what my plan was and is still, right? And it changes. I mean, when, 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 kids, when kids were little bitty, you know, we would do Bible stories at night and then put them to bed. That kind of, we'd do Bible stories and prayer you know, and, and then we put them to bed, right? So that's different. It, it, right now, with a junior and a senior, they don't want me to do a Bible story and put them to bed. <laughs> Not only that, a lot of times I go to bed, I think, before they do. I'm like, I'm going, Dad's going to bed, y'all, you know, whatever. Um, but here's what I'd say. Teach them diligently. You need a, a plan to teach them. And then it says, and then I'll, so I'll give you what I think is the plan, the best. Again, I'm not an expert, I made tons of mistakes. So don't think I have it all together. Please hear me when I say I don't have it all together. And if I could go back and do it again, there's probably a lot of things I would do different, but that's a different sermon, right? But let me tell you what I did that I think worked, okay? And it's this. I was opportunistic. So, so commitment, I was committed, diligent, tried to be diligent. I could have been more diligent, obviously, but I was opportunistic. He said, talk when, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, find the opportunities in the day to talk about God. So what I still do with my kids, and it's, it's not always the same because I have three very different personalities, right? Um, I have a daughter, Mariah, and I love her death. So Y'all know her. She's, she's my senior in high school. Uh, she just turned 18 years old, which is incredible to me because she's about this big. Um, and, and so, uh, but with her, she's a girl. So all I have to do is ask her half a question and I can have an hour and a half conversation. <laughs> hey honey, how was your, you know, here we go. Right. And then, uh, my oldest is pretty talkative, but it, you kind of have to wait till he talks but he's usually you ask him a question and he'll start a conversation or he'll call, he'll talk. My youngest, we, we, he doesn't talk. He just doesn't say a whole lot. He's an internal processor. And, and, but here's what I started doing is I always talk to him about their day, what's going on. And what I find is like, for instance, these are conversations we've had. We've had conversations about pornography. We've had conversations about, hey, my, my friend just came out as a transgender 
Um, and we've had conversations about, you know, lying, and we've had conversations about integrity, and we've had conversations, uh, you know, about purpose and all these things. But what I did is I would find out what they were curious about or what they were dealing with, and then I would go back to the Word of God, right? Like a friend, they need, like, here's one you're all going to deal with, forgiveness. Why do we forgive? Well, we forgive because we're supposed to. No, we forgive because forgiveness is a blessing to us. Because if I don't forgive, I'm going to be bound to what happened and tormented by it. And we forgive because Jesus died for the sin that, was, that we committed. And he died for the sin that was committed against us. And you can, and I mean, so like, this is why we forgive, guys. And then you can have a great conversation. We had a great conversation with them. So I'm just saying, you can be opportunistic. What are the kids talking about when they get up in the morning? What are they worried about? What, what, what's going on in their world, right? Uh, and when they're going to bed, or when they're on their way to bed, hey, everything all right? You need anything? Everything good, you know? Um, and then hear them when they're talking about stuff. So, so be opportunistic and then be consistent. It says, bind them as a sign on your head, put it on your forehead, I mean on your hand, put it on your forehead, write it on the door, doorpost. In other words, you gotta be consistent. So, so if we're gonna teach our kids a biblical worldview, I think we have, to be, we have to be committed to God ourselves, be diligent, be opportunistic, and be consistent. So how does this work? Well, we have to say God's word is the authority. And let me tell you what that means. That means as parents or grandparents, I need to know the word of God. I need to live the word of God so that I can talk about the word of God. I need to know the word of God. Used to, we studied the Bible. Now we read it for our verse of the day that makes us feel better. Yeah, I thought that'd go over about like that. <clears throat> are you are you hearing me? Like you used to, we studied it, and and now we just want one verse that makes us have a warm fuzzy for the day. And I'm I'm all I love fuzzy verses, guys. I do. I love fuzzy verses. Like I will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you, God. I need that promise, right? But I also need to know what the Word of God says about all types of things in context. Does this make sense to everybody? All right. So there's that. There's what I think. Biblical worldview. Talk about it with your kids, right? Here's the second question I want to ask. This is a good one. It's um, can women be pastors? Because most of you know we have a female pastor. And I think it's a great question. In fact, this was asked several times. And it wasn't asked, I don't think, in a negative way at all. It was like, hey, help me understand because churches I came from did not allow women to speak, and our church does. Um, and so I want to answer it because you need to know because we have a female pastor, or we have a, fe we have a female pastor. We'll probably have more female pastors uh, as time, and we have female teachers, and we have female leaders. And so, so we were saying, hey, you know, uh, can women be pastors? Um, so here's what I say. This theologically is debated. So I'm going to tell you, uh, not just my opinion, but I'm going to tell you because there are two sides of every argument, right? So I'm on this side of it, and there are a lot of theologians that what I'm going to tell you would line up with what they say, right? And they're theologians. In fact, one, uh, one New Testament scholar, I don't agree with everything that he says, but he's really smart. Uh, Dr. Thomas Wright, Dr. N.T. Wright is a, one of the theologians that I'll, I'll always like to hear his perspective. I don't always agree, but I like to hear it. And, and, but he is a New Testament scholar uh, by far. And I mean, he, his Bible is not in English at all. He reads the, the Hebrew and the Greek Bible. So I, that's what I'm saying. So smart guy is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so, uh, so anyways, and then there are other ones too, but he's more known. Uh, so can women be pastors? Well, when, the, when, when you have the debate, there are going to be two key texts from the New Testament that people are going to point to. And really when you read them, it's, it's kind of like, well, it seems very clear. So I certainly get the debate. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is going to say women should remain silent in the church, right? Um, and then let me show you uh, 1 Timothy 2.11 says, uh, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain silent or remain quiet. Now, when you read, these are both the writings of Paul to the church of Corinth, also to um, Timothy. If you just read that in any Bible, you're going to say, well, it's very clear right here. Very clear. Women should not talk in church. <laughs> it's what it says. <laughs> 
right? And so when you have people over here saying women, women can't exercise authority over man, they have to learn quietly, they shouldn't talk in church because those are what those two verses and these are the two verses that are used the most, some very dogmatically, I might say. By the way, this is a conversation I had with one of my kids because he had a conversation with a friend at school and he got in the car one day and said, hey dad, why can we have women pastors? And I'm like, that's a great question. Let's talk about what the Bible says. So when you look at those two verses, it seems very clear. But what gets a little muddy is when you go back to the Old Testament, you have God appointing a female judge, Deborah. One of the 12 judges over Israel was Deborah. You have women who are prophets, right? Um, specifically, you have uh, Huldah and, and Miriam. Who, who are considered prophets in the Old Testament. So, so we have women prophesying and God appoints a female judge in the Old Testament. And then we get to Paul's writings and, and, and he says women should be silent. All right, so, so, let's, so here's what I always say is, when it looks like the Bible doesn't make sense, it's not because the Bible doesn't make sense, it's because you don't understand. So when we're looking, it's like, well, God in the Old Testament, because now we're under the new covenant of grace, and you would think under grace, maybe in the Old Testament, women couldn't talk, but surely under grace, women can talk in the church. Think about it. If women couldn't talk in the church right now, and not a knock against our men or anything, but who would be teaching our children about the word of God? Because guys, you'd be signing up. You're like, this is my whole thing. The people say, well, women can't talk in the church. Well, they sure let them teach in Sunday school and, and in the kids' programs. And all the men want to come in, just sit down and, okay, anyways. <laughs> Let me get back to work here. So, so what I say is when it doesn't look like it makes sense, it's because I don't understand. So let's dive in together. So 1 Corinthians 14, number one, we need to ask the context of what is going on in the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians, there's six different questions that they're asking Paul um, and the one he's specifically answering when he says women are to remain silent is he, in the context of 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about order in church service because it was, it was a free-for-all, if you will. And he's talking about how to keep order. Now, you don't actually have to look very far to find what you might think would be a contradiction in 1 Corinthians because, watch this, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, this says, this is Paul writing, but he says, every wife who prays or prophesies, so let's just stop right there. So what did he just say? Because he's talking about church and church services. What did he just say? There are women who are praying and prophesying. Now let's see if he says this shouldn't happen. Let's see what he says. He says, every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Now, what is he forbidding in that verse? He's forbidding women who are prophesying and praying publicly in the church to do it with an uncovered head. He's not forbidding them to pray or prophesy. He's forbidding them to do it without. Now we need to ask ourselves, is that command of covering our head, is, is, is that a command that is transcultural or is it just in the culture? Because there are things in the Bible that are specifically, they were things of culture that really, because we're not Jews, essentially, we wouldn't apply them. Does that make sense? In other words, we don't require women to wear head coverings. That, that was a cultural thing. So that command is cultural. It's not transcultural. The way I know that is because the people that, think about it, the people who say, well, women can't speak in church, they don't require them to wear head coverings. Well, Paul just said they should wear head coverings. So, so this is where it gets a little bit muddy. Are you with me so far? So, so what is Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians 14? Well, if you kind of break it down, in 1 Corinthians, he's already established there are women who are going to prophesy and pray in, in the church gathering. Right? He established that in chapter 11. What he's establishing in, in 14 is going to be consistent with 1 Timothy in just a minute because what he's actually saying is, but the women... Um, in their culture, many times could not sit where they could hear, 
A lot of times in their culture, the, women, the men got the better seats. The women were in, in the back or a different place. Women weren't able to learn, and so they're asking questions. And it's creating a commotion. Imagine if all of a sudden y'all just back here start asking questions. You start asking questions. Not to me, but you just start asking questions of each other. Like it would, everybody would be like, what's going on? That was what was going on. So he's like, hey, the, the women, while they're learning, essentially, they, sh they shouldn't be asking questions while the message is going on, essentially. That's the context. Now, the reason I would apply that context, a couple reasons. So 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because it seems very clear. Let women keep silent. Let them learn with submissiveness. I don't permit a woman to teach. So Paul is obviously, he is, he's restricting something. He's restricting something. What is the context of the letter to Timothy? The first letter to Timothy. People teaching heresy. That's the context. So you need to know the context, right? Because in 1 Corinthians, of the, of the six questions they asked Paul, none of them were, can a woman preach? Does that make sense? So when I understand the context is about worship services and how to keep them in order, that gives the context to, you see what I'm saying, to his words. Because in, verse, in, in chapter 11, is if they're speaking and prophesying, make sure their head is covered. But if they're sitting in the back and they're trying to learn, make sure they stay quiet. So it's not a contradiction when you're given instruction based on the question that was asked. So what's the problem in 1 Timothy? Heresy. People are teaching the Bible, are teaching about God who don't understand the scriptures. Right? So then Paul says this, kind of interesting. Paul says, let a woman learn quietly. First of all, this, if you understand that word in the actual Greek language, you understand that word is let them be discipled. Let them be discipled quietly. That, the, the reason that's significant is because women weren't discipled in their culture. Men were. That word, actually, you, you, it has the, it's the same picture, same root word. You go back to where Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and Martha got all upset. Y'all remember that? Do you know one of the reasons why Martha got upset? It was not a woman's place to sit at the feet of Jesus and be discipled. Culturally, Mary would have been sitting there with the men, now, what was Jesus' response when Mary sat with the men to be discipled and Martha got upset? What she's done will never be taken away from her. She's done the one thing that counts. So when a woman sat in a man's, cultural man's place to be discipled at the feet of Jesus, what was God's response? Good for her. Are you with me? Okay, so let's keep going. So, so it's saying women should be discipled. Now, why should women be discipled? Remember what Paul's saying, don't let anyone teach who hasn't been discipled. Because if they haven't been discipled, they're gonna teach in heresy. So what's the context? Well, he's saying let women be discipled quietly. Now, this is where it gets a little bit, I mean, people will make the point, but it says don't let a woman assert authority over a man or teach a man. Well, you got to look at a lot of different versions of the Bible and you got to look at the Greek. The problem is, and here's where the problem comes in, the Greek word for exercise authority in this verse only appears one time in the Bible and it's in this verse. So a lot of times when you're studying the Bible, you go back to the original Greek word and you do a word study and say, where was this word used in other places in scripture? Because it helps me get the context or where did this like, where did Paul use this word in another place? Because now I know how Paul uses that word, right? So this is one of the healthy ways we interpret scripture, right? Um, or understand it. Well, Paul uses a word that's only used one time in all the writings of Paul in all the New Testament. And it's right here, this take authority over. And this word has about 13 different potential meanings. But here's what's consistent about this word. It is aggressive. In fact, the original King James used a word called usurp authority. We don't use that word anymore. Usurp, usurp, the reason they use that word versus exercise authority. Exercise authority just sounds like I'm exercising authority that I have usurp actually gives you the picture that I'm taking authority I didn't have. You see the difference in the words? So that's what this word actually means, to assume authority you don't have. And so what he's saying in the text is women should be discipled before they, before they speak, 
They should be discipled before they speak. And when a woman's been discipled, let's not forget that the man is the head of the house still. And if she's not submitted to her husband, because the original King James, it says exercise over a man. King James says the man, meaning her husband. So what he's saying is you can't have a woman who is not in submission in her home, but yet takes by force authority in the church. Because we all know this has happened with men and women where they have tried, they, they had a teaching gift or whatever, or they just had authority or influence and they wanted to come in and take authority where it had not been given. Are, are you with me? Now, to me, one of the things that's most amazing that we miss in scripture, because we're talking about the writings of Paul and we're talking about understanding women pastors, one of the things that never ends in the conversation is Romans chapter 16. Let me show you something from Romans chapter 16. Most people, and when they make an argument, women should be silent. So the way I see 1 Timothy is Paul saying, before women can teach, let them be discipled first. And even if you have a woman teacher, her house has to be in order and she can't try to by force take authority that God hasn't given her or she's not been recognized to have in the church. Does that make sense? That's the way I see it. Let me tell you why. Romans 16 verse 1. This is usually never in the conversation. This is such good text, y'all. I commend you, Phoebe. Now, does that does anybody remember Friends? <laughs> remember Friends? I'm not endorsing it, not, not endorsing it, not getting on the train. Okay, I'm just saying, was Phoebe one of the men or one of the women? Phoebe is the women or one of the women, right? And it, by the way, if you look this up in the Greek, this is a feminine name, Okay. I commend you, Phoebe, our sister. Well, now it's very clear, isn't it? <laughs> Who is a servant of the church of Centuria. Well, I, I can't say that word right. Never mind. This was a port by Corinth, this town. So there was a, it was like a satellite church of Corinth almost, but down by the port, it's about five miles away, and this was the church there. So this is a servant of that church. And he says this, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. Now, if Paul is sitting around saying, don't let those women talk in church, no woman should talk in church. Boy, he's sure speaking highly of this woman who's a leader in the church. Not only that, now here's, here's what we know and then what we don't know. Do you understand who carried the epistle to the Romans was Phoebe? When Paul sent the letter to the Romans, this is why he's saying, I commend to you, Phoebe. He's saying, she's got the letter. So when Paul sent the letter to the Romans, it was carried by a female. Now, here's what we know possibly. Typically, when a letter was read from an apostle to a church, it was read by the one carrying it. So it is highly likely that the first time anyone heard the letter to the Roman church, it was in a female's voice. Highly likely, can't prove it, but based on everything we know. So, so he's saying, here's my sister and I want you to assist her, whatever she needs. Look, she's been a helper of many and of myself also. Now this does not sound like a misogynistic apostle who doesn't want women to talk. Now let's read a little farther because Romans 16 gets a lot more exciting. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. What's significant about that? The female name is Priscilla. The male's name is Aquila. Why did he greet Priscilla ahead of Aquila? Most, many theologians believe because Priscilla was actually the pastor of the church. And Aquila was helping her. And so he addressed the pastor, just like, just like if you were talking about a pastor today, you typically greet the pastor and then his spouse, right? She, he greeted the pastor and then his spouse or her spouse. Now it gets better. Are you ready? This is all in, first, all in Romans 16. Okay, verse seven, greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen or my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, they are well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. Why is this significant? 
because if you look in the Greek, most versions call this name uh, Junia. It's actually Junius, and it's a female name. Why is that significant? Because he says, these are my kinsmen and they're prisoners. In other words, he's calling them apostles. So in, in Romans 16, 7, it very clearly seems to state from Paul's behalf that there's a female apostle and a female pastor and a female letter carrier. That is why for me, when I look at that and I put it with the Old Testament where I have female judges and all that, and then I look and I study the text and I look at the writings of Paul and I look at the context of these two verses, to me, I don't feel like at all the New Testament forbids women from having places of authority or being pastors or for teaching. I don't feel like it at all. I feel like very much you can make a case for it easily as I, I think I just did, right? Also, let me give you one other thing. I, there's the fruit test. This is just logical. What's the fruit test? Well, when I think about women in history, recent history, Mary, Mary, Marie Woodworth Eder, Catherine Kuhlman, um, Amy Simple McPherson, these were dynamic women of faith who some of them started, denomin our denominations were started because of them. Amy Simple McPherson, the Foursquare Movement. And then I look at modern day women who teach and who are bearing tremendous fruit in the church and around the world, I'm like, well, if God was against it, he'd shut it down. Yes. Who am I to fight against something God seems to anoint and bless? Amen. Right? I know several years ago, uh, 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 Beth Moore was attacked. And my thought was, uh, I, don't, I didn't throw my hat in the race as far as my opinion. My thought is, well, let's look at the fruit because the people who are attacking them are, are not bearing as much fruit as she is. Just about every woman saved today has been to a Beth Moore Bible study and half the men, whether they wanted to go or not, got some of the information, <laughs> you know? And so, all right, so does, does, that make, does that make sense? All right, number, number three, last question I can deal with today, and that's this one. If God is good, why is there evil and suffering? It's a great question. It's a great question because, and you think about it, it makes sense. It's been argued by a lot of, in fact, an, a, people have an atheistic worldview would argue that this is a reason to not, that there is no God. Because if God is all knowing, he knows evil exists. If God's all powerful, then he could stop evil. And if God is all loving, then he would stop evil. So if God knows everything, he knows there's evil. If he's all powerful, he can stop evil. And if he's really good and loving, he would stop evil. So how do we answer the question that there is a loving, all-powerful, good God, but yet there's evil in the world? Let me give you an apologetic answer, a philosophical answer, and a theological answer. How about that? All right, let's start with the apologetic answer. If God is good, there's evil in the world. First of all, the moment an atheist or someone who doesn't profess faith in Christ admits there's evil, they've made a case for God, not a case against him. Let me explain why. You can't have evil without good. You can't have a shadow without light. Does that make sense? What is darkness? The absence of light. So there's light and the absence of, there's darkness. What is a shadow? Something's blocking the light. So the moment you make a case for, for evil, you're making a case for good. Once you make a case for good, now we're to the place of objective morality, which an atheist cannot justify. The only way to, uh, to justify objective morality, okay, meaning there has to be a standard of morality that exists and it did not come from humans. How do we know it didn't come from humans? Because atheists or people that don't believe in God, they will argue that look at the suffering, look at the bad in the world, look at the evil, Right? And that means there's no God because look at the evil. But you could ask most of them, is murder wrong? Yes. How do you justify it's wrong? Well, all, everybody thinks it's wrong. Not Stalin. Not Hitler. Hitler didn't think racism was wrong. And he sure didn't think murder was wrong. He murdered six million Jews. And he did it thinking it was a moral thing to do. And you're like, well, that's, that's kind of extreme. Yes, but we could all go through history 
and we could all go through the newspaper and we could find people that don't adhere to our moral standard. The question is, where is the moral standard? Because once we say men can't be, mankind cannot be the, 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 the standard of morality, in other words, morality is not subjective, it's objective, meaning it does, we don't want subjective morality because that's how we get a Hitler and a Stalin and a Jeffrey Dahmer. That's subjective morality. Are you with me? So we want objective morality, meaning we want a standard of morality that everybody abides by. Well, not everybody believes the same things are right and wrong. So when you take the big ones like, well, murder or whatever the case may be, then it, rape and murder and these big ones, okay, where did it come from? Justify objective morality without God. Justify it. Try it. It cannot be done. So once someone says there's evil, there's good, once there's good and evil, there's a standard to tell us what is good and what is evil, and that standard had to come from something beyond us, someone bigger than us, outside of us, ahead of us, before us. Are you with me? So there's, that's your apologetic answer. All right, what's your philosophical answer? Well, what is evil? Because what you're arguing is God is so powerful, he could just stop evil. But what you're arguing is subjective evil. Because what you think is evil and what I think is evil may not be the same evil. Let, let me make a case further. You want God to stop a murder. That's evil. But what I would say is I've committed evil in my life. God could decide to start with me and just incinerate me right here because I've been evil. See, we want people to not lie, but are you saying if God, where, here's the question is, where's the line on evil? Because what you're going to say, well, it's obvious. Evil would be murder. Evil would be rape. Evil would be robbing and stealing, right? What is evil? Cheating on your taxes? Is that evil? Well, evil would be stopping abuse of substances. What about abuse of sugar? You're going to let God take your donut away? <laughs> it's not healthy for you. I'm not saying you can't have one. I'm just saying we all know there's nothing nutritional about a donut. And if you eat enough donuts, they'll kill you. So philosophically, if God starts eradicating evil, where does he start? Does he start with you? And does anyone survive? But what we want is we want God to serve our ideas so it'd be, well, what I say, and obviously everyone thinks just like me. So what I say is evil. That's the evil God I want you to eradicate. The other thing is, remember how we talked about we don't know everything? Yes. We talked about this last week. Science says that of all that can be known in the universe, humans fathom 4% of what can be known. So there's 96% that we can't even fathom about the universe. They said of all knowledge, so that'd be the 4% we could fathom, we can only, the average human, what, used to they said 3%, then it said 1%, now it's 0.00002%. That out of everything that could be known, the human actually knows 0.0004 in a two. That's le so I don't even know what that is. It's a fraction of a percent. Are you with me? I'm not going to do the math. I don't have a dry erase board. But my question is, are you saying that, that God in his infinite wisdom couldn't actually use evil? That evil serves no purpose. Because remember, God is oriented by purpose and plan and design. And if he eradicates the world of evil, what if he's using evil? You say he would never do that. He used Pharaoh. In fact, this verse is in your Bible. It's a verse about Pharaoh. And he says, I will raise you up by the power of my hand. He's not talking to Moses. He's talking to Pharaoh. I'm going to show my power through you. He's talking to Pharaoh. So, um, so if God, philosophically, if God's going to eradicate evil, where does God start? I hope not with me. That's what I hope. Let me give you a theological answer. The only way to eradicate evil would be to eradicate good. Because good is a choice, just like evil is a choice. So I can't, re once I remove all evil, I've removed, no one can do good anymore because you no longer can choose to do good. And once I can't choose, I'm no longer a free, free will moral agent. I can choose nothing about my life. And I can't choose a relationship with God. 
The reason there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden was because man has to have the ability to choose evil in order to choose good. And man has to have the capacity to choose to love God and serve God or to choose not to. It's the only way for God to have a relationship with us. So the reason God put that tree in the gardens, he said, if, if man can't choose evil, they can't choose good. If they can't choose not to have a relationship with me, they can't choose to have a relationship. So I have to give man the free will and an opportunity to make a decision. Knowing they will use that power, some of them will choose good. And some of them will choose some very grotesquely evil things. And ultimately, I will let them choose and still, and still work in creation to bring about my plan, letting man have their own free will and their moral choices. Now, let me answer this. That doesn't sound very loving. Well, God must be loving because God got off a throne, put on flesh, and decided to suffer for us. So he must be loving. And by the way, after everyone's finally made their choice in the end. So you have, you have the end, the second coming of Christ. You have the millennial reign of Christ where Satan is bound. Then Satan is loosed and given one more opportunity for people to choose because he leads, he deceives the nations one more time. And people make their decision on if they're going to be with Jesus or not. And after everybody's had their chance to choose to be with God or to not choose to be with God, then we've reigned with God for a thousand years. Everybody gets another chance to choose to be with God or choose not to be with God. Then God eradicates evil and heaven is a place where there are no tears, no suffering, and no pain. So. Amen. Hey, thank you for your questions. They were great questions. Did you enjoy that today? Why don't you stand with me? Yeah, that was good. We can give God praise. He's ultimately the one that came up with everything. <laughs> um, I love it, man. I just love these conversations. Thank you so much for asking questions and listening. And I hope this helps you and helps you in your conversations uh, with your kids. So let's, let's bow our heads for just a moment. I want to pray for us. God, I thank you so much for your word, for your grace, for your goodness. Um, God, that your word really does, it speaks to the issues of life. And it speaks to the hard questions. And God, ultimately what it tells us is that we're not alone. And when the questions seem to have no answers, we're not alone. And when life is extremely difficult, we're not alone. God, when life is painful, we're not alone. Um, God, that's what your word, that's today. We see that so clearly. So God, I thank you that you're a God who is all knowing, who is all powerful, who is good but who also is near. And so God, I just pray today if people are wrestling with these questions or issues or pains or kind of what J -Dub was, Pastor Dub was speaking, God, the people may be going through difficult times. God, I just pray today they're reminded that you're good and that you're near and that your word speaks. Um, I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come. We end all of our worship experience with a time of prayer. So if you're serving on prayer team, I want you to come. With their heads bowed, no one looking around, they're going to make their way. I just want to give an opportunity today, ultimately. I, you know what I really want to pray for today? I want to pray for people who are, who you just, it's, you're struggling right now. And you don't have to tell me how. It could be with doubts, but it could be with a family situation. Whatever it is, I just feel led to pray this way. Uh, it could be a work situation. I don't know. It could be any number of things. And you don't have to tell me. I don't need to know. I just want to pray for you. So your heads are bowed. No one's looking around. But if that's you and you're like, Pastor, I, just, I would love some prayer today. Will you just lift your hand up and say, that's me. Yeah, God bless you. Thank you. Like today, I'm just struggling. I'm dealing with stuff today. God, I thank you that while I don't know what everyone's going through, I thank you, God, that you do. And not only do you know, but the promise of your word is that when we pass through the fire, you'll be with us and we won't get burned. And when we pass through the water, you'll be with us and we won't be swept away. That's the promise of your word. So Lord, today I pray for, for, for those that may be watching online or in the room and, and they're, they're just, they're dealing with life. They're going through life. Lord, today encourage their souls. 
Lift them up. Let them know you are near. Speak peace to their storm, to their hearts. God, let us understand sometimes you don't calm the storm. Sometimes you just calm us. But God, I pray you'd speak peace to their hearts, to their lives today. God, I pray you'd meet them right where they are. Strengthen them and encourage them today. God, give them grace. Move in their situation, I pray. God, for all of us today, Lord, we want to see you move in our lives. Even if today, God, we're not struggling, praise God for that. But God, still, you can move in our lives. You can call us closer to you. You can teach us and speak to us and lead us and guide us. And God, that's what we want. God, we want to be close to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Yeah, you can give Jesus praise. <laughs> Listen, God bless you. I love you. Um, I'll be out front if you want to say hi. Other than that, God bless you. Have a good day. If you need prayer, please come. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you. Hey, welcome to Pathway. Pastor Marty here, and I want to say how excited we are that you chose to join us online. It's incredible, and I want to encourage you now to stay connected with us. We don't want you to miss any of the content that we offer because we believe in connecting people to purpose, and we hope that everything that we offer will bring encouragement and hope and strength to you as you follow Jesus. Uh, there's a few ways you can stay connected. Number one is subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then click the notification bell. You'll get notified instantly whenever we offer new content Content. Also, you can like us on Facebook um, and you can follow us on Instagram. We were so excited to have you. I believe God has incredible plans for you. The best is ahead.